Welcome to another episode of the Neuro Marbles. <laughs> Dana and I cannot, we cannot contain ourselves. We, as you see, we oh are, and here we are the consummate professionals. Always. Yes, always, always, yeah. Always. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but we, you know, for, for the audience, we were talking about the separation anxiety that my dog has. And, and Dana was... Um, commenting on how interesting she thought that was that I'm a psychologist that has a dog with yeah. serious separation anxiety. Um, and so we were talking about CBD treats that, yeah. Yeah. that made that's a laugh. good yeah. transition yeah. to our episode today on ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> and I, my dog that I used to have totally had separation anxiety. So the take home message here is we work really well with other people, but we can't apply to our own lives at all. <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh my gosh. Well, hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Yeah. Um, you know, Dana and I really wanted to to talk about um, attention deficit today because yeah. we're seeing an explosion of um, adult diagnoses actually in, yeah. in ADD and ADHD. And so we really wanted to just have a conversation about yeah. it today, but maybe we can just start, Dana, on um, what attentional problems like actually look like. Yeah, so you you had gotten the DSM out, and so there's what the DSM, you know, yeah, there it is. Woo! Except now there's a text revised, so you need to buy a new one. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much the same. Uh, even though I think I was laughing so hard when we were talking about anxiety, and that we we're going to talk about ADD because it, it, I think it's just a really good way to cope with a lot of the stuff is through humor and those kinds Amen. of things, right? Amen. Yeah. Um, and. I will oftentimes say ADD, even though it is ADHD, there used to be an ADD in the DSM and they've returned the H to there, but the H is really the hyperactivity part, which you, you can see in adults, but that tends to be more in kids. And usually by the time people reach adulthood, the hyperactivity part isn't there or it looks different. So instead of being physically hyper, maybe someone's mind races a lot and that can be with that. So it's not necessarily as, as evident by the observer, right? <clears throat> but attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it sounds horrible, right? Yeah. The, everything in the DSM is disorder, but the deficit part to me always rubbed me the wrong way. Um, part of it is because it, this, these kinds of things really exist along a continuum. So any of us, Everybody knows what it's like to not be able to focus on something, right? And and usually what grabs people's focus, it can be something external, right? Like we're having our roof worked on and they're doing a bunch of other stuff for the house. And if there's a day where they're banging a lot, I have a really hard time focusing on anything. So the the distraction becomes the deficit, right? So there's something that can cause that moving right where your whole world is turned upside down and you've lost all routine we've talked a lot about the importance of routine on this podcast yeah. you don't have that routine you're starting a new job you're going to a new school you're going from high school to college and all that structure is missing now you're dealing with all that stuff shifting and it's like an external version of the deficit right because it's not the way it was um diagnosable ADD or ADHD is really thought to be, um, certainly those distractions can grab someone's brain who really is ADD. And then there's also something different about the, the way the brain works that you can distract yourself better, or it's really hard to focus on one thing for a period of time, especially if it's something you're not interested in. And we'll, we'll talk about kind of hyper interest in a little bit here. But this can look really different in adults. It can look at like, it can look at uh, like um, impulsiveness, like someone all of a sudden saying, well, I want to do this thing. And you say, wait, you haven't thought it through. Or um, disorganization is a huge one I see with adult clients. They either are dis completely disorganized or they're hyper-organized um, to, they're basically imposing that structure on their life and they've figured out, oh, organizing really helps me do that. But more often than not, I see adults that have really hard time organizing. Mm -hmm. um, time, you'll hear these things like poor time management. Uh, and it really means 
time gets away from people that that are ADD, like especially if you get really focused on one thing, you're not aware of how much time passes, like that hyper focus. Um, focusing on a task, folks that are ADHD can be super wired in if it's something they're really interested in, to the point where it's practically inhuman, the amount of attention to detail and focus for a long period of time that, that folks have that superpower, but it has to be something they're really interested in. If it isn't, you know, if it's schoolwork or something that they're not interested in, it's really hard to bring your attention to it. So late papers and, and at work might be projects that you're not turning in on time. Um, then other things that are a little more oogie, you know, you might have a heart, your, your wick is shorter. So uh, you're quicker to anger or quicker to um, feeling overwhelmed or something along those lines. And uh, if your bucket is already full because of ADD, any little stress on top of that might be the, the thing that makes that wick, you know, melt fast and now you've got the explosion, right? Um, and so you can have that kind of uh, difficulty with, with uh, tolerating frustration. You'll see that in the DSM, those kinds of things. But I really see that as a, what overall stress is somebody under when their brain is working a certain way? Right. Yeah. That, that, it, that is opposed to how learning systems might work, for example, for example, the one thing that I do want to dispel a little bit, though, uh, is the, the whole multitasking myth. So a lot of my ADD adult students and that I teach will say, oh, I'm 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 ADD. And so I need to be scrolling through my phone during lecture. And then I'll say, well, actually, the whole multitasking thing isn't it helps me pay attention. Actually, no, it doesn't. So we know that any form of split attention splits your attention. Um, I'll say, what do you need to do like to move your body or whatever to be able to pay attention, but paying attention to something else that is gonna grab your focus at, away from what you're doing, you're just gonna, it's gonna go one or the other. So you're not gonna be able to pay attention to both. Um, and the whole idea of multitasking, nobody, can 100% multipass. I think I read a, a, yeah. a statistic that 3%, between one and 3% of all humans on earth have the brain that can truly multitask. Otherwise what it's doing is it's flipping back and forth actually between those two things. You can do it that fast and maybe look like you're multitasking, but anytime you're taking your attention away from something, what you're focusing on first suffers. Yeah. And if, <clears throat> if you amp that idea up and put a lot of power behind it, that's what ADD folks deal with every day, just because of how their brain works, right? And so we do things like we medicate them. Uh, putting a medication in someone that sustains attention is sort of like bumper cars, right? Where you're doing a like the, the car things at Disney World where I loved that as a kid, I finally got to drive something, but it has the one rail up the middle so you can only go so far. So it's sort of keeping you on the rails. Um, and that can help. I've also had people say, oh, I don't know if I'm ADD. I took a stimulant and it helped. Everybody will do better with the tension with the stimulant, whether you're ADD or not. Mm -hmm. The question is, what, what are you like when you're not medicated? I mean, it can somewhat be diagnostic if it really helps you concentrate. And then when you feel it wearing off, you're really having a hard time. That can be somewhat diagnostic. But we're really talking about a pervasive, um, lifelong difficulty um, sustaining, uh, and I'm gonna, I hate these words, right? Sustaining attention. Um, if you haven't watched, and I, I hate to sort of send you to a competitor, but the Holderness family, um, you've seen these videos, the, the father's ADD, and they do a, fun, a really, bunch of really entertaining videos about what ADD looks like, but also what are the positives of it? They may go a little bit too far. Like, this is great. I have ADD. I, I don't think it's great to have ADD. Yeah. But if you are, if you're using it in a way that serves you and you, you know when and where it's going to be there or not be there, you can um, harness that and again, be in the driver's seat. If it's, um, if you start to really learn about yourself and what things, what it looks like for you, because not everybody looks exactly the same especially given you have to look at how much stress is going on, right? So this last weekend when I was giving uh, uh, test answers to my students, they had a take home test and my, I have a bad disc in my neck. It was flaring up and I couldn't lift my head very well. 
and I just told them, I said, I'm having this thing, you know, if, if I'm walking around like this, it's because I can't lift my head up. And then I found that I couldn't track anything. Like they would ask a question and I'd say, wait a minute, can you ask that again? I, I didn't catch that. That's like a really good example of how all of us can have attention pulled away from something that's stressful or has your attention, right? Um, but it looks different in adults. Adults have learned to cope a little bit more, to yeah. hide it more, um, or they're in the workplace and they're getting marginalized. And you've mentioned like once you go to college, you don't get those support services. And certainly a lot of workplaces don't give those support services. So people really can kind of crash and burn in adult life um, if they haven't had those those supports as well. Yep. Right. Yep. You know, I think in general, when I think about attentional issues, mm -hmm. we see a few kind of thematic things, right? I have a hard time initiating attention. Like, mm -hmm. you know, how do I get that started? Right. That could even look like functionally a difficult time starting a task. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, which yeah, where did is, dive in. Yep. right. And, you know, I think a lot of times we'll say, um, I don't know if the audience has heard this or you, Dana, but like, you know, are you a, are you the person that swallows the frog or not? You know, that idea of you, you do the hard thing first. Right. Uh, and then yeah. after the hard, but I will say most of my clients do better when things are broken down into smaller pieces and we choose next action steps. And the next action step itself is what leads to the momentum to getting a task started. That Absolutely. is what I, I see to be more effective, like in my, in, with the adults um, that I work with that have attentional issues. Mm -hmm. But so it's like, I have a difficult time initiating my attention. I have a difficult time holding my attention on something. Mm -hmm. Usually it's mm -hmm. something that either I don't understand or I'm not interested in. Both of those things yeah. I think exist. Or I have a difficult time shifting my attention, right? Yeah. Like I have a hard time shifting from this to this, this to this. And so yeah. um, I don't think, I mean, I worry about like our the brains that are being developed under social media or under technology. Yeah. Um, they're very immediate. You know, when you're on your phone, it's all immediate gratification. You can Google anything in a heartbeat. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, there's kind of like this, what I consider like inch deep, mile wide knowledge versus deep knowledge about something. You know, everything's very superficial. So you're just, you yeah. know, flitting from one thing to another. But, the, you know, to have the diagnosis, you really need to see some sort of interference with the functioning. So it's yeah. not situational. Like as you were saying, you know, yeah. this is something you've seen long lasting, pervasive throughout your life that started as a kid, mm -hmm. right? And either you compensated for it with more work. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's usually what people do. More work mm -hmm. or you underachieved. Yeah, you bring up a really important point because uh, one of the criteria in the DSM, at least, is that those symptoms were there from when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people, especially if they're older, don't have access to that info, but also it sort of is not easily defined. You'll hear things like they don't turn their work in or they, their work is sloppy or they don't seem to really care and some of those kinds of things you'll see as kids. And if they're not good reporters of that, it doesn't mean that they weren't as kids. It just means they don't know how to articulate it well from that point. Um, and so, yeah, it is sort of that lifelong pervasive idea. And also, as you're talking, it's reminding me of what a lot of people that I see struggle with ADD is a neurodiverse issue because as you're talking about these various things, I'm like, oh yeah, that could be autism. That could be autism. So they're 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 two separate circles in terms of um, we think anyway in terms of what's going on in the brain pervasively and all the time. But they over they can overlap a lot, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen countless memes of this is actually the autism and this is the ADD and where they overlap. Um, yeah. And so you may or may not be autistic and ADHD, or you may or may not be autistic and have some traits. We call it traits when you don't reach the whole diagnosis of ADHD and vice versa. I've had a lot of folks that are ADD that are like, oh, I wonder if I'm autistic. Yeah. And there is a lot of overlap, but that's that whole umbrella of neurodiversity, right? And if it's if it's a neurodiverse component, it is lifelong. You see that always. Mm -hmm. Right. The default is there. So even if you learn these coping mechanisms, you're always going to go back to what the default is. Right. Yeah. 
And yes. this cultural sanctioning of ADD, like the phone stuff and the media gratification. And you are, you're like a pebble skipping on a pond and never really going deep into stuff. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It teaches that, which is kind of a problem. Yeah, it does. And that you can get something right away. I mean, it's yeah. the very opposite of like grittiness, which, you know, we just know grittiness to be a really, to be a huge success factor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Whether we go back to the marshmallow experiment, which, you know, for those of you that don't know the marshmallow experiment, it's the idea when you're little, it's one of the, probably one of the most um, robust, longstanding experiments we have in regards um, to frustration tolerance um, and yeah. the predictive value of that for from childhood to adulthood but yeah, the idea yeah. of little kids um they're told right you can have this marshmallow now or if Ooh. you wait until i get back you can have two yeah right and then the camera sits on them and looks at what they're doing while they're waiting if they're waiting it's yes they're going and through some struggle <laughs> this is a struggle it's a struggle especially for a little one like a five-year-old yeah. right yeah. who's being asked to do this right. but what we find are the kids that are able to wait for that second marshmallow or double the reward are the ones that do really well from a temperament perspective or better, I should say, as adults. It's very predictive. Um, but this or, idea, yeah, go ahead. Use that Dana. example with ADHD. What if you don't like you marshmallows? Don't care for marshmallows? So it's not a right. really big thing to lose to only have one. Right. Maybe you don't want to. So yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, um, uh, but you know, attention has always been, and and the way even we we test attention formally is on a mundane, mm. boring task. Yeah. That's how we test attention. We don't yeah. test attention in a gamified way, right? Because the that gamification is in essence what fills the gap for mm -hmm. you having to exert any kind of mental effort. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. all of that is reducing friction to spending longer time on a platform. Right. So right. that's not how we test attention. We test attention <laughs> on the yep. world's most boring tasks for 15 minutes, right? Like yeah. Yeah. that is yeah. how we test attention. And so, you know, with this kind of explosion of ADHD and ADD and, you know, I'd say ADHD because it's the formal diagnosis. Like the formal right. diagnosis is ADHD with different subtypes so or predominant right. types. So forgive me because I don't mean to say everyone's ADHD, but – Right, right. That is the formal diagnosis. The term being um, used, yeah. You know, I think just for us to understand like, you know, is it a trait? If it's a trait and you're an adult, you've probably compensated. Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. you do something about it? I mean, yeah. yeah, you know, it's environmental change. Mm -hmm. It's, um, but how do you build grittiness to stay on something? Yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> that's where that self-awareness comes in too. I think yeah. why it's so much harder when you're a kid because you, you have to do certain things. Uh, yeah. You're going to have to do things that you're not interested in, but also to be able to recognize what those are. So if I know when I'm studying for something, I, I can say to myself, oh, having a TV on is, you know, it's more entertaining, but I know that it impacts my ability to sustain attention on something, especially something that I'm not interested in. I can tune it out when I'm totally interested in something. But if I'm trying to learn something that I'm not that interested in, but I have to learn it, I have to have that complete attention. And for me as a kid, I, I, I don't consider myself the diagnostic full blown version of it. I think for me, it's more about an autism that overlap piece. Yeah. But to try to, you know, reading was early, it's really hard for me. I had eyes that didn't line up and there was a lot that went into that, but that, or reading for the first time, reading novels that didn't have pictures in them, I was just bored. And it was, it was torture to sit there and try to read that. We didn't have audiobooks then. I, that would have changed everything for me if I could have listened to something instead of having mm. to read it or at least do it at the same time. Yeah. Um, and so those are the kinds of things you'll see where uh, I think it frustrates family member too. You get those things like you're not trying hard enough or just sit still and pay attention. You don't understand that you're actually asking that brain to do something it doesn't have the capability of doing. Yeah. And now we're seeing some things that are really cool that are starting to emerge um, that are different for that. I love this. Um, a uh, picture that some colleagues of ours on the East Coast have, the one autistic psychologist, they posted a picture of her 
looking at her computer, doing some work, but she's crouched kind of like Gollum, but she's sitting on top of this stool that's actually higher than the computer itself. And it's just like what her body needs and she can work like really well like that. But it's just a picture of her doing that. That would look so uncomfortable to anybody else. And it, it goes so against what we tend to do to kids in school, right? Yeah. And not even just out of, not even just uh, uh, pri elementary ed or primary ed, if I have students that have a DSS, have a disability support services thing put in place because they're ADHD, one of the first conversations I have with them is do what you need to do with your body during lecture to make it, make it so you're okay. And I'll do other things like they get the whole lecture ahead of time. Um, they have all the readings ahead of time. They can, they know when they need to have them. But I'll, a lot of times those students, even, you know, these are adult grad students that made it all through undergrad and they'll be in the back row and they just get up and they kind of pace around. And um, I wish we could do more of that uh, in our in our culture to kind of, that's that idea of that neurodiversity movement. Let's recognize that these brains are wired differently. They don't, they don't, our brains don't act like the majority of people out there in that bell curve were in one of the tails. And why marginalize those folks and say, no, you have to fit into this in the middle of the curve learning because it, it takes some work to, you know, it, it, yeah. it takes the teachers. And I understand it's much harder with kids because they, if they're pacing around the back room, they may be distracting other kids. But there has to be, you know, these, these things that you put together IPs about, right? Yeah. Limit the amount of time that they're having to spend on a task to, you know, 20 minutes, half hour, whatever it is, instead of making them sit there for three hours and read this book. I mean, you have to change the environment again to fit that brain. And it's an arduous process. I get a lot of uh, people that are undiagnosed as kids um, come to me as adults. They don't know what's going on. I say it sounds a lot like ADD, or I can't tell you how many spouses I've sort of inadvertently diagnosed by listening to someone talk about their spouse. I'm like, oh, it sounds like they might be ADD. They might want to go see somebody. And the, it, it, the complaints are the same as like you'd hear a teacher complain about a kid in the classroom. You know, spouses or partners are saying like, oh, he's so disorganized, or we can never get out of the house on time, or um, why, why, are, why is she doing that when we have to leave the house right now, right? Yeah. What is why can't she just pull herself away from that? Just leave the house. It's not that easy. Yeah. So if you recognize, again, that self-awareness piece, if you know that's you, what do you need to do to give yourself to create your world that optimizes your brain? And then again, educating as an adult, because uh, that's what this podcast is supposed to be about, adult ADHD. Yeah. How do you, how do you um, educate your workplace, or if you're an adult learner at school, how do you do those sort of things? For me, it was an epiphany in, because I, I think I shared on here before, I didn't do well uh, until the later part of, of um, high school and then did really well in college because I started writing things down almost verbatim that the teacher was saying, and I could see them being written down and I was listening at the same time. And that had never occurred to me or no one ever taught me that when I was younger. And I found listening and writing everything down, it was, it was almost an eidetic memory. It would just get in there. I did, it was almost effortless. And I thought, God, how much better could I have? And granted, it could be that my, my brain was finally formed by that point. But we have to, I'm looking at this list that I was reading earlier, trouble multitasking, excessive activity, poor planning, low frustration. It's all these negative labels versus something like, um, multitasking is something that that brain can't do. So let's set it up where you don't have to do that. If you have right. excessive activity or restlessness, let's figure out a way for you to, you know, have extra running around in the gym time, poor planning. Mm, maybe they need help planning. Maybe yeah. they need to be taught a system of planning, right? Low frustration tolerance compared to who? So let's teach this kid or this adult to recognize when they're frustrated so they can say to the other person, I think I'm about to explode here. I'm frustrated. And then you can say, oh, okay. Right? Yeah. And that's I love the, it. Yeah. I mean, I think the reframe is important because it's like, yeah. you know, if, if you look at if you look at the three areas of of the way, you know, there it's oversimplified, but but the way attention mm -hmm. works, right? Initiation, sustaining, stopping, and shifting. Yeah. If you look at those areas. The, the when the, what you can say is, wow, it's really hard for this person to plan ahead. It's yeah. hard for this person to stop a task they like 
or they're into to start another. When you put it that way, then you immediately go to strategies and support, right? Mm -hmm. Versus, Mm -hmm. well, they've just got low frustration tolerance, Yeah. right? And, you know, I I think, you know, um, reframing, changing narratives, you know, it's not some juju hoo-hoo stuff, you know? It's not just like, um, and you and I, we bag on positive psychology quite a bit because Mm -hmm. I think there's a piece of us that, really, you know, kind of say, you know, but you can't look every, you can't look at everything through a rose colored lens. There are things that are really challenging and and how do we address those? And I think, you know, if, if you're an adult who's struggling and you haven't been diagnosed, it means that you have compensated throughout your life because you're here now. Right. Right. So the question is, how do we reduce friction and reduce suffering for you? Like it's, it's not fixing you. It's mm. how do we make things feel better to you so that you have resources left for other things? Or mm. maybe it's problem solving something so that you're not always in conflict with people yeah. that depend on you or support you or that you share your life with. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's where I see ADD and ADHD for an adult to be quite destructive actually. And it's relationally. Yes. Yeah. And oftentimes in that relationship, uh, turning to substances is really, really common in adult ADHD. Very much Um, so. Very mm -hmm. much so. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, I, uh, I would imagine some of those attention features and, you know, uh, if the house is perpetually a disaster and those kinds of things can really, cause strain on any relationship. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, and then it becomes, uh, how do you, again, how do you name it? How do you have both of you see it in a way that those things are actually named? So you're, you're repeating, this is not how my brain works. This is not how my brain works. This is how it works and accommodating it in that way. And I think that's, what's really great about it falling under the neurodiversity umbrella, because it really is starting to shift that narrative. And I think people are starting to look at it differently rather than it's just this, oh, there's this thing you should take medication for and there's something wrong with you and we're gonna give you medication to align you with how everybody else thinks, right? Yeah, yeah. And then positive parts of that, like I've seen lists upon lists about people through history that have done some really great things who were neurodiverse, you know? So it's not all this negativity. What, what else was going on there that had those people excel? You know, someone like Einstein was a white dude, you know, and, and so he had a lot of privilege there, but it was really, those systems were okay with all these eccentricities because of th- this hyper awareness and things that those people can do. Why was that allowed in that particular instance, for example? Why? Yeah. And you can really, you can go back and look at that, the, the, um, the context for that. And he, he drove people crazy. He drove it. He says, if it weren't for my wife, I never would have been able to do anything. She's the only, she's the one that kept everything organized for him and where to go at what time. And, um, so it's, I always liken it to, if you look at a house that is framed, all the framings up, and then you basically layer on top of that. It's like a skeleton and that's what makes the house. ADD and and neurodiversity in general, when you see buildings downtown that are getting refaced, they'll put the scaffolding outside the building. That's what has to happen in ADHD because you don't have that internal framing. So it becomes, how do you get that scaffolding on the outside to sort of hold those things and to get as much scaffolding as possible so you're most likely to be able to succeed on any given day, knowing that there's going to be days where it's it's just not going to go well, no matter what. Right. Yeah, I mean, this is the this is the difference between intention and action, right? Yeah. I intend, and how many times do I work with adults, um, neurodiverse adults, that it's like their intention is always good. My yeah. intention was to follow that schedule. My intention yeah. was to not spend money. My intention yeah. was I, that, like, and then, but there wasn't enough support. And in your example, scaffolding. Yeah. In order to make that intention an action. Right. And that's where I feel like things break down. You know, usually when the intention is there, um, but the skills are not there yet, 
So I'll use that growth mindset word yet. It's because the support wasn't enough or Or wasn't or wasn't right. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when you said support. I'm like, ooh, if it's rigid and it's prescribed by the neurotypical thoughts. Right. It's not not right. Yeah. Yeah. So, or, you know, maybe that intention or that goal needs to be a smaller goal, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so that's why, you know, when earlier when I was like that kind of idea of swallow the frog, swallow the toad, that mm. idea of I do the hard thing first, that is usually not actually, you for, for, for maybe neurotypicals, that can be something really mm. successful. Mm. I will say that is a very, uh, uh, I do use that strategy for myself. Um, yeah. And while I have some... ADHD traits, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, and um, and some can I've got some traits of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I can really pull myself right mm. into doing that. Like I, I it, you mm. know, if if I put my mind to it, I can do that. Which that's not something that I think um, someone who struggles with this can do. It's not about putting your mind to it. Yeah, um, when, you, when right? you were talking about the starting placing uh, yeah. earlier. A, a visual of a zipper came into my mind. Think about a zipper that you have to get that little thing in the hole. And if you have a persnickety zipper that oh. won't get in there and you keep trying to keep trying, that's what it feels like where if you don't have the starting place. And once you have the starting place, you're like, up it goes. Love it. And yeah. so, yeah, that's that kind of thing. Like I can't just jump into a task that I have no lead in point for. And I yeah. can look back in my life and think about the ways I, I, I would always be so optimistic. The intention at the beginning of every beginning of school year, I'd have the bright, shiny new books and folders and new pens and get all excited about it. <clears throat> and then as soon as I got a little bit behind, it was over because I didn't know mm-hmm. how to jump back in or there wasn't a structure to put me back in. And I even still do that at, at work at my teaching job. If I have a task given to me, I will say, I need a little frame. I need a starting point. Yeah. And it, it, it's not readily apparent to me. I'll say, can you just talk this out with me so I know where to begin? Right. And that's a great example. So we can't just jump into the pool and not a swim. We have to start at the shallow end and we have to have a path to get to there. But that means once, if we do it that way, we can get in the deep end and do just fine. Right? Yeah. And sometimes, like I say this a lot in my practice, is just longer runways, softer landings. Yeah. We need the yeah. longer runway to get there. Um, and that needs to get set up, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, next action steps, David Allen, like I love getting things that getting things done system by David Allen, mm-hmm. which is like there's a place and a time to do things, which I love, right? Yeah. You can't respond to email while you're driving, right? You're not in the <laughs> position to do that well. So right. you wait to be in those places. And the other is like the next action step is truly the next action step. And so yeah. many of my, you know, um, college students are professionals that need to write, which mm. tends to be an overwhelming task for many because writing is a hard thing to do. And the next action step on writing inevitably for us is like turn on your computer. Yeah. That's your next action yeah. step, you, you know, yeah. with your next action right. step being open up Microsoft Word. Yeah. With your next yeah. action step, right? So to do that, that I means, ain't paralyzed by I don't I don't even know how to start, right? Right. Or, like I don't know how to write yeah. an essay from top to bottom. It's like I'm out. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but you know how to turn on your computer. You know how to open up Microsoft Word. And mm-hmm. you know, and then now we teach you how to do an outline, right? Or, or like whatever that is. But to your point, I need the lead in. Like yeah. I need to yeah. know how to get there. And that's an executive functioning piece. Like Yes. And yeah. we haven't even talked about executive functioning in the midst of of, AD, of our conversation of ADD, ADHD, which executive functioning, meaning how do I pay attention to something very difficult? How do I bring it to my conscious awareness and mm-hmm. create the steps, including the motor sequencing to do this thing, whatever that is? Yeah, I was it's thinking hard. when you were talking about and permission to not have to do it all perfectly right away. So I oh, think yeah. about the home improvement stuff I do, oftentimes the whole thought of it is overwhelming, but doing one step at a time in the process of trying to pull out an old gas fireplace that we have and we're having to cut metal and this kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, I did enough for today. I can't get it all done now and I can continue the next day. But then also that if I don't have that planning, that sequencing of something that, that executive functioning does, it'll say, here's the entry point 
here's what you keep need to keep doing. And here's the sequence you need to continue to plot along with. Yeah. This is the proverbial, you know, Hey, make a peanut butter sandwich. And so you take the bread out and then you're like, Oh, squirrel. I mean, because yep. the attention is pulled away or now you've put the, you know, you put the peanut butter on your hand and you're like, wait, where did the bread go? Executive functioning makes sure those sequences happen and in happen and in the order they're supposed to happen. And that can really break down uh, in ADHD. And we know executive functioning is one of those areas where we can see that. We can test that. We can do all kinds of tests that have been made up that test executive functioning. And that's where the a lot of the, the issue is or sustaining that is where mm -hmm. the issue is. Someone could be plotting right along really well with their executive functioning, but a distraction pulls them out of it. And they can't just return to where they left off. They have to go back to the beginning. And especially in little kids, when you see that, they start to get pegged as obsessive. Oh, wait, you can't just pick up where you left off. You have to start over again. You did that already. Why are you doing that again? Yeah. It's because I don't know any other way than to start over again and see. Right. right. I don't know. Yep. And you, you know what, where I see this as well, Dina, is um, with my autistic adults who mm. are having conversations and they get interrupted. They're yeah, they're totally. expressing an idea and they get interrupted because someone's in, someone's not being a good listener. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I get it because some some of my clients can um, information dump. And so it can really tax the patience of others. So I understand the relational idea of this. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying right. it, it's a natural kind of thing relationally. Right. But that when they're interrupted or their thoughts are interrupted, they got to start from back from the beginning mm -hmm. again. And then people are like, oh, you're scripting. It's like, no, 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 no. They didn't finish. Yeah. So yeah. if you want them to finish, be quiet, zip the mouth and like, listen, yeah, you know, which is just another. I mean, obviously, I've, we I'm in a luxurious position as a therapist because the session really is about the client. So I yeah. I can listen for 20 minutes on an information dump, right? right. Um, so I think, you know, this piece here is really, I, I guess, in my mind as an adult, it goes back to the quality of life. Like, mm. how is this? neurological difference that you have been wired with. Okay. Yeah. This is not a choice. You've been wired this way organically. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're not lazy or you don't know. Yeah. Yep. But you do have, we, how can we empower someone in that position to be like, mm -hmm. Oh, there is movement to reduce suffering here. That's really what we're talking about. Like, how do we make life suck a little less? You know, you know, I mean, like, you know, I, and we all struggle with that. I mean, I think, you know, like, can I, can I, can, can life suck less today? Like, which is the very opposite of the self-help movement, which is like stoicism and go own life. Right. It's like, no, 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 no. Life sucks. How can life suck less today? Right. Like, yeah. And that's just a funny way of looking at it. And you and I talk a lot about using humor. You and I use humor a lot in general. I mean, we could yeah, barely yeah. start our episode today <laughs> without laughing because, you know. You, you, you were, classic. and I, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling today with this episode because we've mentioned in the other episode that my camera won't stay focused and it's, yep. it's all I can do to not pay attention to it. I mean, it's the sort of, you can see it, I'm feeling it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the skills that I also picked up, and and I don't know whether kids could use this or not developmentally, but in a in a conversation, sometimes I like if I'm at work and we're having a group conversation, I'll actually write down what we left off on or what I left off on, yep. so that when the conversation comes to a lull, I can go back to that and not have to start over. But I think for little kids, they have to do that because they they don't have that fill in development yet, and so you can teach. Or I'll ask my wife if we're doing something and I'll say, what were we talking about again? And she'll say, oh, blah, blah, blah. And then I can pick up, it's like ask the other person for the starting point again without it being the original starting point. Yeah, right? I call that bookmarking, bookmarking which I, yes. I know I know that like many don't have the experience of a physical bookmark. Like I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because of my age. But yeah, me too. Um, yeah. that idea of like, how do you put a placeholder 
a you know mm-hmm. physical placeholder somewhere so that you know where you left off. Yeah. I think you know what complicates that piece, Dana, that I see is anxiety. The anxiety oh, of yeah. not being yeah. able to finish my thought, the anxiety of not being able to communicate this, my anxiety of that, right? Or losing the thought. Yeah. Because anxiety will make you lose a thought quicker than anything. Quicker. You know, it was so interesting. I, I, with, on my, on my um, channel, I, I interviewed um, a developmental optometrist and I'm, mm-hmm. you know, fascinated by the visual system because of its heavy input into our brain, right? Two thirds mm-hmm. of our, of our neurology is really wired for visual input. Yeah. 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 And um, what he said was under distress, in the fight flight mm. system under distress, your peripheral system becomes very, very small, almost mm. like a straw and mm. like seeing through a straw. And it just made me think like that is, I get it. Like if you're about to be hit by a car or you're running from a bear, you might want to be very, you know, you you don't want a lot of visual information and you want to respond. But yeah. because we're not usually anxious in those situations, because those situations really aren't present for us, you know, usually right. day by day, right. yeah. we lose all of this information Yeah, yeah. in those moments. And, but we're just physiologically wired that way. Like that's just our, yeah. you know, fight flight kind of arousal system. That's it, again, protecting us. So can you imagine a, a kid who's dealing with this and anxious all the time and they're basically going through school looking yeah, through a straw. Through a straw. And the teacher wants them to look over here and they're yeah. like, wait, where, where is it? Because if you try to find that thing just through a straw, it's incredibly difficult. It's it, it's incredibly yeah. difficult and frustrating. So, yeah. you know, you know, so what is the episode about today? It's like, hey, how do we understand ourselves? What is really ADHD? You know, like really, what what does it mean? What does it mean to you? And what can you do to make move the needle on the reduction of tension, mm-hmm. conflict, suffering? Yeah, like because there are lots of beautiful ways to manage ADD and ADHD. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, mm-hmm. Um, and maybe what it means is someone helping you identify what that endpoint is and the plan to get there. Like, exactly. yeah, you know, um, yeah. and getting the support, you know, you need. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's mm-hmm. not about a moral, this is not a moral diagnosis, lazy, yeah. unmotivated, don't care. Yeah. This is really the way your brain's wired. So yeah. how do you lean right in and address it? Yeah. Some empathy. Cause I think when we say we live in an ADD culture to, yeah. to your point that we started with, with the, all the distraction with phones and things like that. If that helps you as a non ADHD person, understand how easy it is to get distracted by that. That's what people, you know, that are ADHD or neurodiverse are, that's the way their brain works all the time. Yeah. Right. So being able to help, yep. yeah. Like to help them slow things down, get that entry point, get that path. Well, yep articulated and so on. Yeah. And sometimes like, this is what you need to be focusing on right now. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. you even need, they might even need help on like where to put the focus. That, yeah. This yep. is where it is and this mm-hmm. can wait. So the other thing that people don't realize, and we didn't really necessarily get into this, not that we have to, but there are different subtypes or predominant yeah. types of ADD or ADHD. One is inattentive, which I always call the silent ADD because no one can Aww. see it. Right. Yeah. Inattention is I have a difficult time paying attention, but no one knows that because my body is still and my body yeah. looks like I'm paying attention, but my mind is distracted. Ooh. My private world, my private space is not here. And of mm. course, the hyperactive type, which we tend to see in like the physical restlessness right. of someone. Um, but, you know, by the time you're adults, you've probably compensated well enough to where your attention is inattentive, meaning mm-hmm. no one sees it. Yeah. You experience the restlessness inside. Yeah. But it's That's not right. coming out physically through your body. Right. You know, all of those, it's like how in the only way to get through that is through compassion and understanding, self-compassion and understanding, because mm-hmm. no one benefits from shame and judgment. That's right. Whether That's it's self really- right, whether it's self-driven, uh, self-driven or not. That's such a strong statement. I'd like you to repeat it again. Which statement? Just kidding. <laughs> that 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 um, that judgment and shame is really never 
a motivator and never helpful for anyone. If anything, and I'll rephrase it, it's a, an, it's oppressive. Yeah. Yeah. It's oppressive. Yeah. And yeah. it really is not seeing that person it, that that's the only purpose it serves. I yeah. can't be uh, made to deal with you. So I'm going to put you in this box and say, there's something defective in you. And then I don't have to deal with you. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You know, and maybe Dana, like in another episode, and maybe this is where people could leave comments, um, you know, if, if they want, which is, do you want Dana and I to do an episode on strategies, mm -hmm. strategies, environmental strategies, behavioral strategies for managing attentional issues? You know, if you do mm -hmm. like leave those in the comments below so we know to do that, but that could be really helpful. I mean, I do that that's like very much and squarely in my wheelhouse, um, yeah, in absolutely. regards, yeah. you know, to that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you guys, thanks for being here and being with us for another episode. Um, and thank you to Dana who basically has been resisting the urge to fix her camera for <laughs> about 46 minutes. Just saying. Pretty good. No. It's pretty good. It's really I would never have been able to do that as a kid. There, there's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Dana was able to, um, even though she had to use some cognitive resourcing yeah. to ignore yep. that stimulus, yep. uh, she made it through. <laughs> <laughs> I also did a lot of therapy on uh, letting go. So yeah. that, that. <laughs> I feel like we should go out with that with like Elsa. You know, let it go. Yeah, let it go. Okay. All right, everyone. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye.